सीरियल है एक्सपेक्ट कर रहे थे डॉक्टर भावना कितने लोगों को अभी तो कमी लोग तो अ वेरी गुड आप गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू एंड आई वेलकम यू ऑल टुडे फॉर दिस वेबिनार व्हिच इज बीन ऑर्गेनाइज्ड ऑन द ओकेजन ऑफ नेशनल आई डोनेशन फोर्टनाइट व्हिच इज कंडक्टेड एवरी ईयर थ्रू आउट इंडिया and this fortnight is being celebrated to create awareness on various aspects of eye donation in addition to uh, eye donation we we uh, do many activities to uh, promote corneal transplantation retrieval as well as uh, surgeries and uh, it is our small endeavor in this fortnight to organize this international webinar on uh, as a series of uh, webinars which we are conducting and uh, today we are doing this eye banking and corneal transplantation webinar we are fortunate to have today amongst us uh, the luminaries of ophthalmology and corneal transplantation we have uh, professor klaus garsipen from germany who is heading the department at university of cologne and professor titial who is the presently the chief of dr rp center aims new delhi we have uh, we have dr ragni parekh from uh, jj medical college uh, mumbai and we have uh, Dr. Samar Basak and Professor Radhika Tandon as speakers today. I welcome our guest of honor, uh, Professor Sarman Singh, who is the director and CEO of uh, AIMS Bhopal. Thank you all once again formally. And we are honored to have you, sir, today uh, this evening amongst us, sir. And we know that you have always been a guiding force in all our endeavors, be it eye banking or any sort of uh, clinical or patient-related affairs, sir. We are truly grateful to you today uh, that you have uh, gathered some time to grace this occasion, sir. so uh, i uh, we straight away start with the keynote lecture of professor titial today and he will be speaking on uh, newer norms of i banking uh, we welcome professor titial to give his keynote address very uh, good afternoon to all of you uh, indeed uh, it's been a, a real pleasure to be amongst the luminaries uh, who are sitting today and uh, my greetings to director uh, professor sarman singh who has been a, a real force behind the uh, whatever new developments which has occurred in aims bhopal and uh, congratulations to uh, dr bhavna for uh, getting this uh, very important uh, issue of social cause to be discussed in this uh, fortnight of national eye donation i think things have not changed for us because we still have a lot of backlog of patients awaiting corneal transplant surgeries and over that the entire scenario has changed because of covid for last uh, more than one year now as far as uh, looking into the scenario of uh, covid across the world we know that uh, us and india brazil are the most affected countries in terms of a covid uh, hitting the uh, normalcy of our functioning in the, these countries and this in fact has also impacted the healthcare system and majorly if you look into ophthalmic care eye banking and corneal transplantation has been a major consists uh, affection in terms of services provided to the our country who are awaiting the uh, removal of blindness or eradicating the blindness uh, from our country was the covid started in uh, the first wave of covid in uh, around march april 2019 the entire eye banking was suspended by government of india and in fact uh, all the elective surgery was were, uh, were halted and only the emergency surgeries were allowed and there were a, almost more than 80% decrease of fall in uh, ocular surgeries that included uh, routine cataract surgery also in that period and across the world it it was like that and you, you can imagine what will happen to a, a tissue which had to be retrieved from the uh, people uh, who would have donated at that particular time the guidelines came uh, subsequently which really a bank in a various part of the country precautionary measures were taken uh, to look into a various aspect of corneal tissue retrieval and subsequently transplantations looking into two areas one is a donor related uh, problems which may cause transmission to the person who is receiving or the staff who are engaged into a transplant process 
responsible for the organ transplantation as well as tissue transplantation also. And there's a potential risk of COVID occurring in a patient uh, pre-operative phase during investigations, during admission, and subsequently they stay in the hospital during post-surgery also. This is our data of uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. Uh, if you look into our data pre-pandemic, that is before uh, April 2019, we have definitely come down by almost 80% fall in our tissue collection and almost 82% uh, fall in the uh, transplant surgeries in that period. And the same holds true for the entire country uh, stats. This is from iBank Association of India. You can see there is almost 63% fall in the tissue collection and more than 50% reduction in the coronary transplant surgeries. If you see this scenario, we can understand the amount of people uh, who would have suffered in that period. Many people would have gone into a stage where the vision may not recover after transplant surgery also because many people suffer glaucoma, chronic inflammation, and the number of patients awaiting a surgery in a distant places may not be able to travel to a place where actual corneal transplant can occur in these transplant centers. If I look into our data in National Eye Bank and RP Center, we used to have around 500 cases awaiting surgeries in the end of 2019. But now we know that in 2021, our waiting list had increased to uh, almost 800 patients. So that is a significant increase in the number of cases. This is a graphical uh, representation of how uh, corneal tissue and transplant surgery affected by COVID. Because it, you can see around June 20, uh, we did have a, a significant number of uh, uh, surgeries, but they're all cases were used the preserved cornea for uh, infected cases. Though collection was very, very less, and they lasted up to the December 20. And after the decrease in a wave, first wave, that we started collecting more, more surgeries. Then we had a second wave that impacted the uh, content eye banking also. Now from June 21, July 21, we know that uh, things are coming back to normalcy. So this is a biphasic curve in the two years. I'm showing that would be translated to a various uh, aspects also. So this is a very nice uh, telephonic uh, survey uh, done by uh, LB Pasar team <clears throat> where they contacted various uh, uh, institutions where surgery is being done. And they knew, uh, they came out that eight out of 20 I banks where they contacted could not collect any tissue in the period of April to June 2020. So that is the amount of impact of COVID in these cases. And almost 66% of surgeons could not perform any surgery in that period. So that was a, for the surgeons, you can imagine what would happen to the people who are doing a training or are all fellows. The training has also severely impacted by COVID as such. <clears throat> There's a significant decrease in the number of uh, uh, referral in the US also, and number of surgeries has also decreased by 45%. And the scheduled surgeries have gone down in 2019 to 20, and it was picked up towards the end of 2020 in US. And same scenario is there in the Europe also. If you see here uh, from 2019, 20, you can see the number of surgeries and collections are significantly decreased in Europe also. But the entire scenario across the world is similar. The tissue collection, we have taken a proper guidelines, which has been formed by various uh, committees. The tissue had to be quarantined for 48 hours after retrieval. And uh, mainly it was a hospital uh, cornea retrieval program. Subsequently, we could get a voluntary donation approval also. And uh, from red zones, eye banking activities are totally stopped. Collection of nasal swab for RT-PCR tests is actually not mandatory uh, as per the guidelines are concerned, but is left to the medical directors of a particular institution, depending on uh, their discretion to use this test. Positive uh, cases uh, who have uh, positive uh, COVID-19 disease or they suffered the disease within the first uh, four weeks of uh, their death. This will be a contraindication for a collection. Similarly, a history of acute respiratory illness or fever, which is more than 104 degrees, may again be a contraindication. Exposure to a area where confirmed patients were there within a 14 days where contraindication assessed and people living in the red zone, evidence of conjunctivitis or acute respiratory disease would be a contradiction till date also. 
This is a very nice algorithm uh, published by iBank Association India by Professor Namrata Sharma, where the algorithms are given how our counselors or our tissue retrieval people should apply their discretion to collect tissue or not. So if you have confirmed cases of COVID, you can't collect them. But if you have no epidemiological risk, then also the clinical situation has to be assessed. If it is compatible with COVID-19, then again, we can't uh, take the tissue. And if it is uh, no clinical symptoms, yes, we might take a donation from them and use for our surgeries. Similarly, if I have a clinical situation has to be assessed without symptoms, you might take the tissue, do RT-PCR tests. If they are positive, again, you can't use the tissue. If they are negative, you can use the tissue also. This is a much more clearer guidelines uh, uh, which we have been following from iBank Association America. Artificial test, if results are available, that's going to give, give us a better base for a selection of a tissue. Any signs, symptoms uh, has to be no no for a collection. Similarly, a ST has to be taken appropriately for a contact with an affected patient. Vaccination status is uh, not yet been fully uh, decided if uh, people are fully vaccinated. If they don't have a history of a COVID exposure, maybe yes, we can take. But even patient is vaccinated fully, but if they had a symptoms of COVID, then uh, it should again be an uh, exclusion criteria for a collection of tissue as such. As well as teaching is concerned during this period for our fellows. So if you have a uh, 3D headset system where surgeon and the uh, can say fellows can sit further away from the surgical area, that will be much more better. And in fact, uh, they can see what is happening as good as a surgeon, which is seeing through the 3D uh, polarized uh, glasses. And this will be the better way for future also for all types of teaching, not only for a character plastics, for other surgeries also. Two things I would like to highlight, which are not uh, resolved yet, despite having to go for uh, almost two years with the COVID also. What we know exactly is there is a presence of uh, COVID virus, uh, RNA, tears, and conjunctival secretions. There are uh, reports of presence of viral particles or RNA in the postpartum ocular tissues. The SARS CoV 2 entry genes, that is ACE2 and uh, Temperus SS2, is uh, expressed in the corneal tissue and conjunctiva. So that's a pot potential site for a virus entry as such. There's a recent ev evidence suggesting that uh, SARS-CoV-2 may be able to uh, replicate within the ocular surface cells also. What we don't know exactly is the uh, is there can be a direct transmission of uh, virus from the ocular tissue to when we don't uh, do the transplant surgery to other patients, which with the evidence which we have today, we can't uh, directly rule out that. There may be a possibility though, till yet we have no case report as such. In, fact, in, in terms of uh, in universal testing, which uh, we are thinking of, should we do an uh, RT-PCR test for all uh, disease uh, donors or not? That is left to the uh, discretion of a medical director. But if you see, there are a few reports which have been published, one from Germany. There were 200 post-mortem uh, uh, collection of RT-PCR uh, nasal, nasopharyngeal swabs, and there were no cases positive for RT-PCR RT in these cases. But in US, you can see there are 4.8% uh, donors tissue uh, uh, RT-PCR done from nasopharyngeal swab are positive. This is a study from uh, Delhi from Guranaya Center by Dr. Aroda. It shows 18% uh, positivity in our donor tissues as such. So if we would have only gone with a history which is uh, supposed to be negative from these patients for a COVID, then we would have uh, used these tissues and maybe we are not sure what would have happened in these cases. As for our experience are concerned, we collected 432 donor cornea and we had almost 5.5% positivity uh, donor tissue as such. Universal, universal testing, uh, the, I think the point in favor which I have already talked about is we always uh, know that there are high prevalence of asymptomatic patients. There are significant patients uh, which will test RT-PCR uh, positive in these patients which may actually have the virus and if not, uh, the tissue can transmit the disease, but all staffs can get exposed to a uh, disease in these cases. Therefore, proper precaution has to be taken for a retrieval of a tissue, taking a sample from a nasopharynx, and subsequently doing a test in the lab and safeguarding the entire staff also. 
surgery wise because some keratoplasties like therapeutic cases will be open sky surgeries so you can have aerosol generation and transmission to uh, your staff can occur in these patients so i consider artificial test for a open surgery should be done if not if not for a uh, case like a dsec or dmec where you are not opening the entire eye as such what about tissue which are tested positive for a covid uh, once it comes to eye bag we think of uh, preserving this tissue in a glass tube so that uh, we can use this tissue after a few months or uh, we can assess for uh, rna viral uh, particles in them if they are negative or a positive from the corneal tissue assess we can use them for experimental purpose after disinfection or we can discard these tissue as such so i banking i am sure we need to look into a entire gamut of scenario the published reports experience of various i banks from across the world then form a new guideline because this new norm of post covid is going to remain for a many many years is not going to go away so therefore we have to do a new guidelines come out and then decide what should be done to eradicate uh, corneal blindness in these cases i'm fully aware that i donation four time which is celebrated across the country will have more awareness not only for uh, the people of our society for us also to look into our data then formulate guidelines to improve our uh, eye banking system collection and transplantation thank you for a kind listening uh, it was my pleasure to be uh, with you especially uh, seeing dr sanman singh it Glenn. was really very very you know thank you dr sir thank you it was excellent presentation learning thank you sir it was a very good presentation and uh, about the new norms uh, for i banking in covid times and it was definitely a good learning for all of us uh, uh, whether we are doing an i banking or not or we are doing a transplantation but we should be aware of these i banking norms which presently should be followed and we definitely look towards rp center for fresh guidelines time to time to be issued and uh, so that we this same can be followed followed here and thank you very much sir now i request our honorable director sir professor sarman singh sir to kindly address the guest of honor sir <laughs> to kindly address this webinar sir we are honored to have you sir today this evening i i think uh, after listening dr titial and uh, i i am really uh, for everybody including myself you know i also learned a lot many things and the studies the uh, they quoted uh, these are really uh, eye openers we all know that as uh, dr titial mentioned that uh, the covid has impacted not only ophthalmologist but all spheres of the medical science you know you know whether it is surgery or medicine everybody because everything became covid and covid nothing else so definitely the data and the graphs he showed so it shows that you know up to 50 to 80% decline and that is you know in all surgical disciplines because Uh, dr titial uh, let me tell you that we became totally dedicated hospital so it was already like in aims you were doing some but we were not doing at all because we were you know asked to uh, uh, dedicate the entire hospital for the covid and dr bhavna and all these all all disciplines we put into covid so i think uh, uh, during the covid all surgeons all physicians not related to internal medicine they also learned you know uh, the covid so th that was in a learning also but definitely uh, uh, at this occasion i would like to compliment dr bhavna she is a very hard working and i think now she has got a wonderful team dr titial now almost the all faculty they have joined so the, she is uh, now i i think uh, better equipped and i think uh, you should uh, you know uh, patronize her and uh, her department and i am sure that um, with your uh, guidance and other faculty from the rp center the department of ophthalmology at aims bhopal uh, must be uh, you know at 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 uh, top level very soon and the dedication of dr bhavna dr samendra and some of the young faculty members they are really so dedicated and and i am sure that you know uh, you know very soon we are uh, touching new heights and the i banking uh, definitely the new initiative which dr bhavna has started about two years back and uh, this is doing quite well but as you very rightly said that you know everybody you know even you know centers which are very well established internationally known like rp center also they so obviously uh, we are also not untouched out of that so uh, last you know 18 months or so 
uh, we have not seen but very soon we, we we hope that you know we will the things will normalize and we will be doing good uh, transplant and good surgeries and uh, dr bhavna uh, i think uh, you should continue uh, the the collaboration with the rp center and that will be definitely a uh, great thing and i also uh, welcome and compliment dr claus from germany uh, and i think uh, this kind of luminaries and uh, you have the collaboration and i think you should expand this network and so that you know you can uh, learn from them you can exchange the technology students and fellows and then you know you can grow further and further so i think with these words once again my best wishes and i look forward that you know we will be doing much better in coming years thank you thank you sir for your words of wisdom and you are always the guiding force for us the whole institute sir and we always look forward to your uh, to your guidance uh, sir in developing our departments and thank you sir for being here today and uh, we can continue with this uh, with our scientific program now and uh, i would be introducing the speakers for today's uh, webinar we have a, i could just share my screen so, so is the screen visible sunil yes ma'am your screen is visible yes so we have today uh, professor claus amongst us who is the keynote uh, who will be giving the keynote uh, lecture today and he is known as an avid researcher clinician and uh, a surgeon par excellence worldwide and for minimal corneal yes ma'am corneal transplantation surgery he is the chairperson and the professor of uh, ophthalmology department at university of cologne in addition to being the secretary general of germany ophthalmological society he has numerous publications more than 500 and various uh, keynote lectures and orations to his credit in addition to various patents to his credit and we are fortunate today to have him amongst us uh, we have professor titial uh, who is the chief of rp center aims new delhi and uh, he is uh, he has been conferred with padma shri for outstanding work in the field of ophthalmology by government of india in addition to Uh, the senior achievement award by the american academy of ophthalmology and various distinguished award from the apo the asia pacific academy of ophthalmology from asia pacific association of cataract and multiple awards from all india ophthalmological society he has been uh, an academician worth inspiration and he has uh, been uh, he has to his credit around more than uh, 200 publications in addition to various keynote lectures and orations which he has received and chap uh, chapters in various books and he has also authored various textbook we welcome uh, professor titial sir and uh, we have professor radhika tandon who is uh, the professor and also the faculty in charge of unit 6 in addition to co-chair of national eye bank at aims new delhi she is also the chairperson of low vision services and uh, the immediate past president of eye banking she is a have an avid uh, academician she has around over 300 papers in peer reviewed index journals in addition to chapters in textbook and uh, we know that the parsons textbook uh, which is the basic textbook for all of ophthalmologists is been edited by her and we are fortunate today to have her amongst us we have professor uh, we have dr samar basak who is the founder director and hod of cornea services at disha eye hospital he is a person who is known for corneal transplantation specifically the lamellar corneal transplantation and he pioneers in starting this these surgeries in india he has various publications uh, authored multiple chapters and books to his credit and his special interest is on endothelial keratoplasty kpro and osds um last but not the least my friend professor uh, ragini parik madam she is heading the department of uh, ophthalmology at jj medical hospitals mumbai and she is also presently the scientific uh, chairman of bombay ophthalmological association and maharashtra ophthalmological uh, society she has received more than 100 awards uh, for exemplary work in ophthalmology and has received the women achiever award she has uh, since last 25 years she has been doing lot of community of thalmic surfaces and also has distinction of performing more than 100 cataract surgeries in day uh, we are truly inspired by you ma'am uh, thank you for being today uh, with us today and uh, in the chairs we have uh, professor radhika tandon uh, dr samar basak we have uh, uh, dr madam kavita bhatnagar she is uh, heading the department of ophthalmology uh, at uh, aims jodhpur 
And uh, in addition, we have Dr. Prerna Upadhyay. She's a very eminent corneal transplant surgeon in, in uh, at Bhopal, and she's heading the Seva Southern Eye Hospital at Bhopal. Uh, we have an expert panel. We have uh, Dr. Chintan Malhotra from PGI Chandigarh, and she is a faculty there. We have Dr. Gautam Parmar, Dr. Deepak Mishra, who is uh, from BHU, and uh, Dr. Arvind Maria, who is presently heading the Department of Ophthalmology at Ames BB Nagar. So uh, we welcome you all, and I think we can invite Dr. Klaus for his uh, keynote lecture on newer aspects in high risk keratoplasty. Dr. Claus. Thank, thank you, ma'am, for the lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Yeah, dear Professor Sharma, thank you very much for the kind introduction and the invitation. I try to. Um, so I cannot share my screen. Uh, I guess you have to allow me to do this. Now I can do it. Perfect. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the kind invitation and the honor to take part in this meeting, Professor Sharma. We heard from uh, Professor Titia and Professor Singh about the deleterious effects of uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, one uh, good thing to say in brackets is that uh, the pandemic has taught us to uh, better communicate via the internet and to allow such uh, meetings as today where we can share uh, sessions uh, all over uh, the world. So greetings from Cologne uh, here in, in Germany. And uh, I would like to give a short overview on um, new developments in the field of high risk corneal transplantation. Um, if we look at the corneal transplantation field, at least in Germany, we see that there is a huge shift towards um, lamellar techniques, uh, towards DALG, as you see in the top for keratoconus, or towards DMEC, as you see in the bottom for, for DMEC. And in fact, if you look at the data of the German uh, keratoplasty registry, you can see here that over time, the, uh, the green part of the, um, of the transplant, which is DMEC or posterior lamellar keratoplasty is ever uh, increasing. Um, and that is also reflected in the numbers of our uh, department here in, in, in Cologne. We do about 10% of all transplants uh, in Germany and most of them are in fact posterior or anterior lamellar, about 20% are penetrating keratoplasties. So what I would like to do is in the next few minutes talk a little bit about high risk scenarios in DMEC and then about new options to precondition high risk grafts in PKP and a few words about Boston keratoprosthesis. So let's start with um, DMEC and with the question, are there immune reactions also after DMEC? So if you would think from the, or if you could go from the experimental data in the mouse transplant immunology, one would think that we would not see immune reactions after DMEC because we only transplant the torologenic inner portion uh, of the cornea, the endothelium and distal membrane. Whereas the immunogenic anterior portion, the stroma and the epithelium is left in place. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in real life, we know that we have immune reactions even after DMEC, and that has been known for quite some time. Uh, here is a paper from Kolodust from the early 70s, <clears throat> where you could show uh, the Kolodust line immune reactions after endothelial transplantation in the, in the rabbit model. So that is also true for patients after DMEC. As you can see here, we have immune reactions after, the, after transplantation. We even can see codalus lines, if you can see here on the, on the top uh, left, the uh, bottom left picture. And um, these are rare. So we have around 1% to 2% of patients develop immune reactions after DMEC, so much less compared to DSEC or PKP. Um, and they usually are mild, so a lot of patients don't notice them, they don't notice a decrease in visual acuity initially, so these reactions are just observed accidentally on routine um, exam controls. Interestingly, immune reactions after DMEC are also an evidence for donor cell migration after DMEC, so sometimes after DMEC we have this so-called naked stromal area between the donor tissue here on the left, and the host decimate membrane on the right. And uh, if immune reactions occur, uh, sometimes you can see immune cells even in this uh, previously naked stromal area, as you can see here in the red uh, box uh, top left. 
And that is in magnification in figure B. In the middle, you can see that uh, macrophages or precipitates also are to be seen in this formerly naked stromal area. That means um, that endothelial cells migrate out of the donor tissue towards the recipient uh, to cover these, uh, these areas. So we have an indirect evidence for donor cell migration from these immune reactions after, uh, after DMAC. So what is the, the, the risk? Again, we looked at about 1,000 uh, DMAX from our department and, and found out that about 2% of patients develop an interaction episode after DMAX in the first two years. Um, most of them didn't notice the rejection episode, and most of them were already off steroids. So what we can learn from this data is that we have a very low rate of rejection episodes after DMAX, around 2%. Uh, they seem to cluster in the first two years. Most of the patients are asymptomatic. That means you should follow them up for a longer period to detect these rejections. Because, I mean, if, if they are left untreated in the long run, they will obviously reduce the endothelial cell counts. Um, there is a significant endothelial cell loss in patients with rejection episodes, but best corrective acuity usually remains stable in most cases. All of our rejection episodes were reversible, except for two patients, which makes it to 0.2%, which needed a regraft. And 80% of patients experiencing rejection episodes were off steroids. That suggests to keep patients for a prolonged period on topical steroids, even if it's only one drop per day, to reduce the risk of rejection episodes even further. So now this was about rejection episodes in the low risk setting. Um, and this is what we do here in terms of treatment. We uh, uh, treat patients with prednisolone acetate hourly for the first week after transplantation and then taper it down over uh, six months and then keep them on at least one drop per day for the first two years. So why do we give so much steroid in the first two weeks? That is to prevent this complication. Patient after DMEC, uh, four weeks, everything looks nice, but he still he only sees 0.2. We do an OCT and we see a cystoid macular edema. And what we learned is that if we um, give steroids five times a day, what we usually did before, here this is a black bar, and compare it to hourly steroids in the first week, we can significantly reduce the risk of um, cystoid macular edema after DMAC or after triple DMAC. And that's why we give hourly steroids uh, for the first week after uh, transplantation to reduce cystoid macular edema. So now this was low risk DMEC. Now a few words about high risk DMEC. So we started uh, to think about high risk DMEC in this patient. He came to us with uh, severe bullous keratopathy, neovascularization after chemical burn. Uh, cornea was severely sickened, nearly 2, 1200 micrometer with stromal vascularization, poor visual acuity. What we did, we did the DMEC with intraoperative OCT. Uh, why intraoperative OCT? Because the visibility is so poor that um, only with the IOCT we can uh, judge intraoperatively the, the correct rolling behavior of testimates membrane. And uh, this allows to perform DMEC in a safe way also in eyes with severe uh, stromal edema. And what we saw in this uh, patient after DMEC, uh, not only did the thickness of the corneal stroma significantly reduce from 1200 to nearly 600 micrometer, visual acuity increased significantly, but also the um, neovascularization of the stroma and the edema uh, went away. So we observed an interesting phenomenon of increased transparency, but also the regression of corneal neovascularization. And uh, we learned that DMEC also seems to work for high-risk eyes with edema and neovascularization, obviously only if they, don't, if they don't have a scar, and that intraoperative OCT can be very helpful. So having, having done this, we looked at a, our larger da database, uh, the Cologne DMEC database, and found overall uh, 24 patients which um, had DMEC in vascularized, so-called high-risk eyes, with edema and neovascularization. And we looked at these uh, patients and what we found is again, we see a significant regression of corneal neovascularization uh, if you compare preoperative and postoperative. And we see again, a significant increase in visual acuity from 0.6 Lockmar to 0 .4, uh, 0, uh, 0 0.47 Lockmar. So not as good as we normally would expect for DMEC, but significantly better than before. Uh, and we have a rejection episode of about 4%. So that there's a slightly, it seems to be a slightly higher risk for rejection episodes in these vascularized high-risk eyes, but still it's much better than if you compare it to high-risk PKP. 
and from this we learned that uh, DMIC may also be an option um, to be used in vascularized high risk eyes, um, even if um, the visual acuity will not be perfect, but it's much faster than after P high risk PKP. And obviously, the risk for ejection is also much lower than after, after PKP. There's another scenario um, where the rejection risk with DMEC is a bit higher. And that is if we use DMEC for failed penetrating keratoplasty, uh, as you can see here. Uh, we looked at 52 hours eyes from our department with a failed penetrating graft, which received DMEC. And what we notice is that first you have a much higher rebubbling rate because of the posterior uh, curvature of the of the old graft, and that also the rejection rate here is 13% is much higher compared to the normal risk scenario. So there seemed to be also a high risk setting for DMEC in um, regrafting eyes and also in eyes with uh, vascularization. And so there is also something like a high risk setting for, for DMEC. Prevention would be long term low dose topical steroids, also in these uh, high risk uh, DMEC uh, patients. So now I would like to talk a little bit about um, what can we do if we have a high risk eye where we need to do a penetrating keratoplasty? Can we do something preoperatively to reduce the risk? Of rejection episode. Here is a patient again after chemical burn. He um, had a fine needle destruction of his vessels prior to penetrating keratoplasty, then PKP. And now we have a five year follow up with no rejection uh, episode so far. So we thought, okay, is this just an, uh, is this by accident or can this be a strategy to um, promote graft survival? To do a fine needle diatomy, which has been around for quite some time as a technique to um, destroy corneal vessels by unipolar cautery. If you place a 10 0 nylon suture and then put um, um, electrode, uh, electrical energy to it to, so you can cauterize and destroy the blood vessel. And that's something which we actually did already for quite some time. For example, here, this patient was after hepatic keratitis. So we destroy the vessel. We wait for some time. We give him some Avestian subconjunctivally. And then after a, a quiet interval, we do um, a penetrating keratoplasty. And that works very nice to, to, get rid of the, uh, to get rid of the vessels. So we asked ourselves, OK, do, does this treatment also promote graft survival? So we first went to the mouse model. Um, uh, you can see here a mouse model where we induced vascularization in the cornea. Then we put in the fine needle diatomy. We cauterized the uh, the vessels and got this nice wide band where the vessels were destroyed. And then we saw that this destroyed not only the blood vessels but also the the lymphatic vessels of um, these mice. And then we did a um, keratoplasty in the mouse model. What you can see here is, um, if you look at the green line, this is, these are the mice which had been treated prior to transplantation with cautery. Then transplantation, you see there's a much better survival rate compared to the uh, high-risk mice which had not been treated with, with cautery. So then we went on to see, does this also, does this work only in mice or does this also work in patients? And then we looked at uh, patients from our department with uh, high risk neovascularization. And then we treated them with fine needle diatomy and also with subcortical vestin and repeated this as long as the vessels were gone and then did a PKP in the, in the, um, the time afterwards. So basically, if you look here on the, on the top left, this is prior to cautery, then we did cautery and vestin subconjunctivally. Then we still have the scar, but the vessels are gone. And then after some time, we do the PKP. And we had 31 patients in this uh, retrospective analysis. And we had only four rejection episodes in these uh, eyes so far. And if you look at the kaplan meyer survival curve here on the top, that is um, certainly better than what we know from, from, for example, the Australian graft registry for high-risk eyes. So this is still retrospective so we need a perspective we need more prospective data to see if this is true also for larger cohorts but it seems to be an interesting option to uh, reduce the risk of rejection episodes in these high risk uh, patients so it seems that pre-transplant vessel regression uh, can um, promote graft survival after um, subsequent uh, transplantation 
Just another word on this issue. Um, we recently found out that corneal cross-linking also can be used in this uh, context. You all know cross-linking as a tool to stabilize the cornea for patients with keratoconus. Um, what we uh, can also do is to cross-link uh, these corneas to stabilize the cornea and to destroy the vessels. So that's again something we found out first in the mouse model where we uh, induced nevascularization and we cross-linked um, the, the cornea. Yeah. and found out that this not only yeah, reduced uh, blood vessels, but also um, lymphatic vessels. And again, here, if we pre-treat these corneas and then do transplantation, uh, we have a much better um, graft survival. So cross-linking seems to be also an option to get rid of vessels and promote subsequent graft survival. We have some very early data in patients um, where, we do, where, we, where we do this, so we remove the epithelium, put on the, put on the eye drops, and then then put on the cross-linking. Uh, there's some sound in between. <laughs> but you need to mute yourself, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me do the, the transplant. Again, it seems that this is a nice tool to get rid of the, of the vessels prior to transplantation. So in this context, cross-linking not only stabilizes the cornea, but also maybe a nice approach to uh, promote graft survival in the high-risk setting. But again, this needs to be evaluated in larger patients uh, group in a prospective uh, fashion. So last aspect, very short, um, um, you know that, that Boston K-Pro is the ultimate um, option to do something in eyes where nothing else uh, works. We have um, uh, some experience with this approach here. Um, and in 85% uh, of our patients, this led to a improvement of visual acuity, sometimes spectacular, usually only, only mild. But there's one major, I mean, there are several problems, as you know, but there's one major issue, and that is the, the long-term loss of vision due to glaucoma. And that is really difficult to assess, as you know, because we cannot measure the intraocular pressure, and it's, it's really hard to judge how the um, intraocular pressure develops. And here we have one um, interesting novel development that is an intraocular pressure sensor, which can be used um, at the same time of placement of the um, Boston K Pro. And this device has a um, is now a CE sign for at least for the for Europe. You can put it into the, the sulcus or you can suture it, and then you can afterwards use a, a handheld device to measure the intraocular pressure, basically in a telemetric um, fashion. And um, this allows for a, a non-contact, very reliable measurement of the intraocular pressure, especially in this K-Pro patients. And it, this will, and I guess will hopefully reduce the um, long-term loss of vision in K-Pro patients because we can better monitor intraocular pressure and then potentially also something, do something about it. So uh, to conclude, I hope I could show you a few aspects where um, we have hope that uh, we have new novel, interesting developments also in the field of high-risk keratoplasty after the um, yeah, revolutionary change we had in recent years with the lamella transplant technology with DMAC and DALC. And that is that we have a um, um, option to treat some high-risk eyes, not with the PKP, but with DMEC, with a much lower risk of rejection episodes. That we can probably reduce the risk of rejection episodes in some high-risk patients by getting rid of the blood vessels prior to transplantation by, by final diatomy or enter VEGF or by cross-linking or potentially also by both approaches. And that um, the Boston K-Pro um, with this intraocular pressure sensor can be a method for um, a safer performance of this approach because we can in fact measure intraocular uh, pressure in a more reliable fashion. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Greetings from our department of ophthalmology here in uh, Cologne. And uh, yeah, thank you from uh, Cologne. So, thanks, sir. It was a very insightful talk on uh, the newer developments in high-risk keratoplasty. And uh, there are a few questions which we can take. Um, sir, we have one question that uh, this, um, what sectors of corne corneal vascularization are amenable to fine needle cauterization or uh, the anti-VEGF subpendentival injection, sir? 
like it is it the is it small vascularization would be taken care by the fine needle or uh, larger areas can also be handled with this procedure sir I think basically there's no limit. You can uh, actually cauterize whatever you want. I mean, usually it's sufficient to cauterize a big uh, trunk of the vessel at the limbal arcade, uh, and then it will dry out to the, towards the center. But if you do this in a, in a circular fashion in the periphery, you can dry out all the central portions of the vessels uh, at the same time. So there's no need to destroy every single bit of the vessels. If you cut off the supply, they will eventually uh, die off. Um, the, the, the erythrocytes will stay in the vessel lumen for some time, uh, but then eventually they will, uh, they will go off. In about every third patient, it always depends on the underlying disease. In every third patient, you have to do it once or twice again to eventually uh, get rid of all the vessels. And obviously, if you have, for example, hepatic eye disease, you have to combine this treatment with um, antiviral therapy to reduce the, the risk of, of new vessels. But I mean, there's, I, I think there's no, no limit what you can destroy in terms of vessels. You only have to do it again at some patients. And would we, would we, we need to, uh, needing to repeat it uh, later on if some vessels have not regressed? And yes, yes. So, our, so our, I mean, as I said, this is uh, relatively new. We have also only limited experience, but our our, our impression is that the, um, the graft survival is better the more vessels you have regressed. So that means it, it's probably better to, re if necessary, to repeat this treatment once or twice to get rid of as much vessels as possible prior to performing the penetrating keratoplasty. What you can also do is to repeat it again at the time of transplantation um, to get rid, as said, as much as possible of the vessels because that seems to correlate with the, with the rejection episodes. In fact, in our study, um, the patients where we had no vessels at all at the time of grafting, there was, there was zero rejection episodes. So it's probably better to get rid of them as good as possible. Do we have any more questions, Bratendu? Uh, yes, ma'am. We have uh, one question from our uh, resident, Dr. Bhishma. Uh, what are all new options for corneal transplantation in graft failure patients who had undergone keratoplasty already twice? So I'm not sure if I got the question correct. So the question is, can we do DMAC after repeated graft failure or what was the question? No, uh, so the question is, if one patient uh, has undergone keratoplasty twice already and it is the graft, there is a graft failure twice. So what are all uh, options we have for the further management of that case? Ah, okay. So if, so if you have failure, um, I mean, there are two, two, two questions, basically. If you have failure of the DMEC, uh, there is probably no, uh, you, you can do re repeat DMECs probably as, as often as you, if, as you want. Uh, at least the early data we have don't suggest that the re rejection rate increases the more DMEX you do. And um, if you have graft failure after um, PKP, I would always go for a um, DMEX first if the initial graft has worked in a proper fashion. Uh, rather than doing a re-PKP because um, the, if you do the DMEX, the rehabilitation of the patient is much faster. Uh, so we are talking about days or weeks in terms of months or years. And the uh, rejection risk, again, is much lower if you do a re dmac after failed PKP. So I would always try to do a DMEC or a DSEC first if you can do that after a failure of a penetrating keratoplasty. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, uh, since presently we do not have any more questions, as we receive, we can uh, ask Dr. Uh, Klaus. Uh, and in the meantime, we can invite Dr. Uh, Samar Basak sir to deliver his lecture on optimization, maximum your optimization of uh, maximum optimization of tissue during shortage. So, Basak, I share sir. my screen. Yes, sir. Good evening, Dr. Masak, sir. Yeah, so good evening, everybody. So, uh, am I visible? Uh, yes, sir, you are visible and audible, sir. 
ओके ओके थैंक यू भावना फॉर योर काइंड इनविटेशन एंड आई विल बी टॉकिंग ऑन मैक्सिमाइजिंग डोनर कॉर्नियर यूटिलाइजेशन ड्यूरिंग एक्यूट शॉर्टेड इन कोविड नाइनटीन पैंडेमिक आई डू नॉट हैव एनी फिनेंशियल इंटरेस्ट सो माय सिंसियर थैंक्स टू प्रोफेसर भावना शर्मा हेड अफ्थलमोलॉजी फॉर काइंड इनविटेशन प्रोफेसर शर्मन सिंह डायरेक्टर एंड सीईओ ऑफ भोपाल एम्स प्रोफेसर क्लास प्रोफेसर चेयर यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कोलन जर्मनी माय फ्रेंड प्रोफेसर जे एस टीटियाल चीफ आर पी सेंटर एंड ऑल कलीग्स इन भोपाल एम्स सो ग्लोबली देयर इज ए ग्रॉस डेफिशिट ऑफ डोनर कॉर्निया एज पर ट्वेंटी only one cornea is available for every 17 cornea needed till march we are going good across the globe and also all i banks in india so covid 19 pandemic there is a significant acute shortage of donor cornea worldwide in us it is 22% less europe it is around 60 64% brazil it is more than 70% and india it is also uh, severely affected so there are several reports from i bank association of america and from other uh, southeast asia and other part of the world but the demand remains almost the same so if you compare our data in last 3 years you see that indian data is the collection is minus 63% but as utilization has increased initially it was 53% now it is 69% but overall utilization is 52% down so this has already been discussed and published in paper so if you see that our our collection and utilization from this year suddenly we have dropped in 2019 to 2020 the figure down by more than 50% so there should be some strategies to meet the demand and as well as to increase the donor pool and to maximize the utilization so there are several strategies number one is increasing the donor age criteria use of pseudophagic and aphagic donor cornea split cornea concept and other means to save the donor tissue for future transplants so cornea elderly donors from 80 years and above and there is a misconception that older donor cornea means poorer outcome and you know that 88.6% of indian population is more than 65 years or old and looking at the age specific death rates in india number of deaths in the 80 plus group is about 1.2 million annually which translate about 14% of total national death so there are some restriction in different states in india like this was a huge discussion in 2017 i bank may fix the age limit for donor cornea especially in maharashtra and they said that the utility of the eyeballs from the donors above 80 is less than 3% and if you see that as already told that 1.2 million people are dying actually more than 80 plus so this bar data these year census not been done but i am sure that elderly people are more in india now so our data i am sharing that all aged donor during last 5 years we have collected around 8000 tissue from 4000 donor 80 plus donor is 24 8% and mean age of the 80 plus donor is 84 and range between 80 to 102 and you know that if you see the utilization of all tissues versus 80 plus tissue then more than 80 it is marginally lower it is 70% utilization and less than 80 years it is 80% utilization and if you see the 
type of graft we done that we know that in India we have to do a great, good number of therapeutic PK, about 60% used in therapeutic PK, but our overall optical use of this graft is 29.1%, including 120 DMEC and uh, 100 plus uh, DSEC. So DSEC and DMEC is 14% of this more than 80 years tissues. And there are other miscellaneous use like K-Pro, LK, patch graph, et cetera. So we, we recently, uh, our paper has been accepted and it is in press in the Cornea Journal. And we have uh, a solid data of three years. And uh, you see that mean donor ECD of this group is more than 2,800. And donor age is 83 plus, and 96% of the eyes remain clear after a follow up of two years. And mean endothelial density after two years is 1800. And mean endothelial cell loss after two years is 37. So basically, there is nothing wrong to use this uh, 80 plus tissue. I'm showing these two examples. First one is uh, 90 plus, and second one is I used one DMEC with 100 years donor tissue, and the CD was excellent. And you see the cell and morphology of this cell, it is very good. So this patient is still doing fine with 1700 plus cell count after a follow up of four years. So there are a few interesting paper on it, and if you look at this paper and uh, many people, even from uh, Germany, there are papers, and uh, they have also a close crucifix. Their paper is there also. They are also using ATPR. They have a huge data. And second one is use of pseudophagic donor cornea of any age. So if you have very good eye bank support, and if you have very good specular, very good uh, uh, lab to see the utility of the eyes, you can use the pseudophagic donor eyes for even for desmet membrane endothelial keratoplasty. We can also use it for therapeutic PK, optical PK. So you see that with pseudophagic tissue, we can also use in our eye bank. Split cornea concept is nothing new, already been described by many people, including the uh, this uh, crucifen group they have already showed that this uh, it can be used one cornea for multiple recipient and there are theoretical uh, calculation that in two use scenario you can save in 1.5 to 3% cornea and if you believe in quarter dmac then you could actually save 20 to 25% of donor cornea thereby you can increase your donor utilization. So donor preparation, this paper which is, is done also accepted in uh, Cornea Journal recently in press. So we have used a different technique, a novel technique of using DMEC preparation, keeping and our old original the method, made, method the anterior part of the tissue cannot be used for DALC or other surgeries. In the novel technique using BCL interface, we modify some of these steps. The tissue is first placed on a Teflon block with the endothelial side up and a 9.5 millimeter partial trephination is done. It is then stained with tripan blue to identify the cut margins. The peripheral DM beyond the trephination is then stripped off. The DM endothelial edge is carefully identified and loosened all 360 degrees with an elevator instrument. Then, using Macpherson forceps, the DM graft is gently peeled from the stroma, almost entirely leaving behind a 1 to 1.5 millimeter hinge. We then move to a second Teflon block where a B cell is placed and refined to 12 millimeters. Trimming it down to size helps in better air trapping. A 
a three millimeter central or slightly eccentric punch of the BCL is done. The trimmed BCL with central window is again stained with tripe and blue for easier identification. This is then placed onto the stripped part of the donor corneal stroma. Very carefully, the stripped DM endothelium is floated back on the BCL surface and the water soaked to prevent it from slipping. The hinged part of the donor graft is then separated and the entire DM endothelium graft is gently centered on the BCL. The interface fluid is soaked so that the graft sticks to the BCL due to surface tension. Now the BCL supported tissue is flipped over and air is trapped so that it doesn't collapse. The exposed desmets is dried carefully through the three millimeter window and the S-stamp is placed as usual. The BCL and DM complex is flipped back. It is then placed on the second Teflon block with the endothelium side up. And now the final eight millimeter trephination is done. The DMEC graft is carefully transferred to the cup of the donor tissue and stained with tripe and blue and subsequently washed with BSS. The stamped graft is now ready. It is then transferred to a Petri dish containing BSS ready to be loaded into the injector system. The remaining anterior part of the donor tissue is then kept back in the preservative media, which is... So that part can be used for uh, DAL very easily without, uh, you can use up to 9.5 millimeter graft without any problem. So we have used during pandemic, this we had to use this kind of uh, cornea by split uh, uh, technique and we use for tectonic graft large therapeutic graft and also most on capro carrier so during this covid period you see that we our our utilization is almost 107 percent this is uh, in some months it is 113 percent some month it is 97 percent so we have used this uh, way the many total tissue saved during this period is 8.9 percent in our scenario so there are other means not to waste that means many uh, many surgeons and eye banks now prefer to use glycerol preserved cornea in an acute crisis of donor cornea. There have also been discussion about non viable gamma irradiated cornea for anterior lamellar keratoplasty or as a keratoprosthesis carrier. Cryopreservation is also a possibility, but that is not feasible in India. Even the gamma irradiation is not also possible in India because the expense involved in it. But glycerol preserved cornea is the most practical in Indian scenario. The other two are expensive and may not be practical. So in situ collection, our, uh, our theme is no edge bar to the uh, donor. In cornicell and optical media, we choose which one or still we are using 50% cases MK medium. To minimize the cost, uh, MK medium is important, extreme op edges, pseudophagic, uh, uh, if it is used, feel that the, the, the cornea may not be used, then you can reduce the cost. Or if the tissue quality is good during retrieval, you can assess the quality, if the cornea is good, then you use cornisol or optical GS media. The, the algorithm is that with the cornisol media, if it is poor quality, it can go to teaching, and it can also uh, go to uh, uh, glycine preservation. And if it is a good quality, use it within 14 days. Still, if it is not used, because sometimes that COVID wave is uh, fluctuating, sometimes you have tissue, then you do not have patient. So if not used again, you can go to glycine preservation for future therapeutic or tectonic PK. MK medium tissue, good quality, 
use it within uh, four days. If not used, transfer to cornisol. We uh, uh, transfer it to the cornisol, very good quality, rehabilitate it, and then use it. And if it is from the very beginning, very poor quality, we can directly ship to glycine preservation for teaching and future uh, uh, tectonic graph. So in summary, in India, even before pandemic, there was shortage of donor cornea with increasing demand for don corneal transplants. It is likely that we'll have to live with SARS-CoV-2 for at least for next two to three years or even more. Naturally, the burden will increase in upcoming years, so the backlog. This is the time to rethink about different approaches towards issue towards tissue saving and maximum utilization of donor. Thank you very much for your patience, Zayadi. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful and insightful uh, talk, sir. And it is always a pleasure to hear you and see your surgeries. And uh, I have just one question, sir. I think Ragini, madam, wishes to ask something, I think. Yes, Ragini. No, I was just clapping. So, you know what? Uh, now that uh, uh, one thing that you really opened our eyes about is the age of the donor. We are always very skeptical about using donors uh, with a higher age group. And I think your presentation uh, made us a little uh, relaxed. And I think we will be less concerned and... And I think also I have seen you operate and you are so uh, beautiful and you are so careful with the patients and you see your post-op. So the surgeon does matter also so with the post-op results uh, with the age of the donor, sir. The results are, I think the uh, Professor Crucifen also, they have a very big, good big data about that's all different kind of donor tissue. And they have also shown that if you have your eye bank is very good in evaluation, if you evaluate the tissue nicely, then it is just a thought block. You do it only the selection of the donor, a recipient will be, you will have to be a little more cautious that our eye bank, our own eye bank in-house facility, so we are distributing our patients only. So if somebody is 60 plus, we can genuinely use those tissue of 80 plus. But if someone is okay, 20 plus, we, d we do not like to use it. This is the thing. Yes, sir. thank you, sir. I think it's been a revelation and it's, it's, uh, it's, it will be good for all of us. Sir. Thank you so much, sir. There are a few questions from our residents. Uh, there is one uh, very interesting question by Dr. Anija. Uh, if one patient requires full thickness PK, and the full thickness graft is not available, can we use anterior graft of one donor and posterior graft of another donor? Full thickness PK, no, no. PK, for optical reason, you have to use a right graft for optical reason. Like, say, one uh, leukomatous cornea, as the crucifix has shown, that's very good photograph, same, same. Then you have to use the all five layers. But suppose it is a tectonic as a perforating globe, the main aim is to save the eyeball. Globe saving procedure, there the vision is not a criteria. Then you can use the anterior lamellar parts as a short term stopgap emergency measure. And when you have a very good tissue, you can replace it if the visual potential is good in that particular patient. Otherwise, split cornea is basically for DALC and DMAC is the best possible answer. Best possible answer. Okay, thank you, sir. So there is one more question from Dr. Sunil. For long-term preservation, if we put uh, tissue first in the MK media and then after the glycerol containing media, then is there any significant compromise in the tissue quality? No, no. Glycerin preserved, it is for future use. It is only again for future use when you do not like fast last year in April, May, what happened? People are crying for tissue. So glycerin preserved only save those eyeballs. But in future, this might happen in third wave also. We do not know, but you should have some tissue in your stock. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir.
That's why glycine pizza cornea can be kept for a year or two and you can use it when it is a globe saving procedure, not vision giving procedure. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, can I, can I ask a question, sir? Yes. Um, hello, sir. Uh, sir, uh, as a beginner uh, DMX surgeon, we, we get to know that uh, the extreme of edges are usually contraindicated because in younger patients, it is very difficult to peel the uh, endothelium from the donor as well as it, it gives you a tight role. Right, Why right. In the older people, older people, sir, though the peeling is very easy, but uh, what is the what about the folding of uh, the donor? Folding because sometimes they do not have scroll. typical scroll. So they are actually, uh, I, 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 in my hand, it is easier to unfold the uh, yeah, yeah, on older because, tissue. If you use a yeah, stamp yeah. to un, that is easier because typical scroll you may not find in 15, 20% of the cases. Like even yeah. those who are using IOCT, they might be misleading. So in that case, if you give a stamp, use a stamped stamped graph like A S or P or A for whatever, then it will be easier and it opens very easily and uh, unfolding time, in fact, it is less in older donor. Yeah, definitely, sir, it will help in unfolding, but but what about loading, sir? Whether it is okay for uh, is there uh, any sometimes problem Sometimes the typical is... scroll pattern loading will not happen. So sometimes okay. zigzag pattern will happen. So mm -hmm. you accept that, but when you inject into the anterior chamber, it will open and you see thus which side is open. Accordingly, you can flip the graft to its uh, yeah. uh, correct orientation. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, I think we can invite our next speaker now, Professor Radhika Tandon. She would be speaking on uh, pediatric keratoplasty the right way. Madam Radhika Tan. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Many congratulations on a wonderful program and a very good uh, discussion. Um, are you able to see my screen and am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Both. Okay. So, um, yes, now when we're talking about uh, pediatric keratoplasty or keratoplasty in children, um, the thing is that uh, the goals and the way you approach the things are a little bit different from adults. Uh, there are a lot of key um, implications in terms of the visual, de uh, visual development and the entire uh, cognitive development of the child, plus the kind of patients you're dealing with and the kind of pathologies are different. For example, um, there may be some very severe cases where even if you're able to restore some amount of vision and, and, a, and a clear visual access, it can make a lot of difference compared to that particular child living in complete darkness for both the eyes. So therefore I've, I've labeled it as, I would encourage people to look at it as restoring vision in children, looking at the possibilities and challenges, and you have to take a tailored approach. So that is the thing about childhood. It's not only the question of doing the surgery, restoring the vision, but after that, it requires special care, which is more difficult. And effectively, you have to see that is your intervention going to last, last a lifetime? It could imply that at least 50, 60, 70 years uh, of, um, of uh, survival is what you're looking at. Uh, so therefore, it can be quite challenging. So uh, again, as I said, in children, it's not like an isolate to just clear the visual axis and give vision in that particular eye. It is the aim is to give binocularity. Ideally, one would like to give stereopsis. Plus, of course, there has to be uh, comfort and uh, essential is that you have to have very careful follow up and uh, include the parents in the process as well. Oh, one second. So uh, when you're talking about children and vision, uh, you will understand that a lot of these 
uh, children will have multiple other pathologies as well. Of course, we have the cataracts, which could be associated at the same time, or they may develop later on. Plus, we have the concept of refractive error, which has a different implication in children, because that can lead to, again, not, not get, getting the vision that you want. So you have to take attention, give attention to the amblyopia. Of course, the children are prone to trauma and infections and strabismus and amblyopia. So these are the normal problems of children. And then on top of that, you have corneal opacities. And when you have a corneal opacity, which you're going to treat with a, with a, with a transplant, you have all these possibilities which are added on. So it's a very, very complex scenario. The other thing is that uh, I would like to say that uh, still a lot of people are not aware about the fact that vision can be restored in children. So it's very important that one has to have a tiered approach and uh, wherever one is operating, one has to have a, co a combination of co collaboration with the other people involved. So community, there would be screening, field work and referrals. We need to get this message out there. Secondary treatment and then of course at the tertiary. And often it may not be very practical to get the patient to come every Every time to the to the higher center, it is ideal, of course. But you can have a sort of a connection and a collaborative network of uh, of um, people who can take care of the immediate attention of the of the child as needed within, say, twenty four to forty eight hours, and then you can have a, a shared care approach. So here are some examples of patient with trauma, keratoconus, and de developmental corneal opacities. And this is what we want: that the child should have a normal vision and a normal healthy lifestyle and clear vision. The other thing is in approach, uh, I will be coming to the surgical nuances as well, but when you in, uh, explain to the family, the child will, very small children particularly, if you're operating on a child who's three months old, six months old, eight months old, the child may not complain of anything at all. So the family has to be told to look out whether the child is not opening the eye properly, the suddenly increasing tears, they find a kind of an opacity appearing, a local spot of redness, any variation in the size, shape, color, the child is keeping the eye closed, development of squint, and all these things that may not be directly related to the graph sometimes, such as the development of squint. It may be that the child has now developed a cataract or the child has uh, developed um, uh, an inflammatory membrane uh, and so that was very important that you have to have a multidisciplinary approach not all corneal transplant surgeons will have the bandwidth or even maybe the time to to uh, to give attention to all other things particularly i would emphasize glaucoma uh, and the squint and amblyopia so all of this needs to be taken care of so that you end up with a good result and uh, so it can be very important sometimes not the child may not be cooperating for distance vision but you can see how the child looks for near vision the parents can even check at home and as you can see the results may not be always as much as you like here you can see that the child has a divergent squint and if you do the patching treat the amblyopia and then do the squint surgery as well all of this makes a lot of difference so another example of a patient who had um trauma and the patient underwent a PK. Sometimes they may have severe VKC, shield ulcer, may be treated with an AMG and later on go on to develop, uh, undergo a corneal transplant. Here's another patient with a firecracker injury. So therefore, this is the background what I wanted to, to give that always this has to be kept in mind, a multidisciplinary approach. And if, if one is talking about the approach to keratoplasty in children, look back and get the uh, information from the past so that one is better equipped for what, what, what one is to do. There is no doubt there is an increased risk of rejection and higher failure rates and poorer visual outcomes in children. And prior to the 1970s, pediatric keratoplasty was very uncommonly performed. Now, all these things remain even today, but since we are more tuned to it, more, more aware of it, we are able to give better results. And the other thing is, look at the indications for keratoplasty in India. A lot of them are healed infectious keratitis and corneal scar. We also in North India get keratomalacia. These as such are very high risk failure groups where the success can be as low as 40 to 50%. So that's another challenge that we face. The other thing is the timing of surgery. Now here I will say the practical approach is operate as soon as possible. Uh, but sometimes the child may not be fit. The child may not be uh, medically fit or sometimes there may be other logistic issues that the child cannot be operated on immediately. And if you look at the literature as to what should be the right timing of surgery, there's one study which found that children operated less than five years of age exhibited poorer graph survival. But if you look at these results that may be due to a particular 
particular kind of patient and maybe due to a particular follow up pattern and they had taken children age 5 to 12 years and seen who those who had been operated below 5 years of age on the other hand caradrag and all found that in patients age 12 years and below earlier surgery was associated with a higher risk of graft failure then there may be a lot of variations in case mix the protocols used the type of surgery done and so on but overall i will say that with our uh, there is no question of delaying surgery if the patient has a bilateral opacity the visual uh, access is compromised you would definitely like to operate as soon as possible on the other hand you may have a patient of chen which which deserves surgery but the patient may be able to do all the routine daily activities reasonably well of course not like a totally normal eye but reasonably well so you need to see that the vision that the patient has whether it is adequate uh, to maintain the visual development cognitive development or whether one is going to go for surgery and whether that graft is going to survive or not um here again dsec has made a lot of difference in these group of patients but there are other conditions where it may not be so simple surgical challenges as a small dimension is a decreased level rigidity so therefore in children one would like to use flaring the rings the other thing is there will be repeated ga required and there's an increased risk of rejection glaucoma and infection after which sir i would like to stress glaucoma is very important and of course amblyopia therapy and counseling of the parents so these are the challenges and if you go ahead and see what about the outcomes now look this paper presented uh, to publish in american journal of ophthalmology in 2016 again highlights the challenges that i've been talking about 35 children from a very very established corneal unit with excellent surgeons had found that the overall mean graft survival was about 45 plus minus 5.8 months that is you know, not as long as you would like considering the life of the child and the overall survival rate was 75% at one year but this is interesting the one year graft survival rate if you separate the eyes which had glaucoma and the ones who didn't have glaucoma there was a clear separation that is in the presence of glaucoma the survival rate reduces remarkably so this is where i emphasize that if a child has glaucoma then the prognosis is correspondingly poorer and more effort needs to be taken along with the glaucoma team whereas if the child doesn't have glaucoma one may have more encouraging results the other thing as i mentioned is look at the data on a rejection um uh, and uh, looking at the, this is outcomes from uh, from our center uh, india an indian study where pk was performed in 66 eyes of 66 children similar number a uh, reasonable follow up again the children were less than 12 years of age and here the graft rejection occurred in 12% but what is interesting from this data and a take home message for everybody attending is that the mean surgery rejection interval was 10.5 plus minus 7.3 months this goes to say if one has operated the child one needs to have very very careful follow up for the first one and a half years and encourage the parents to be very religious in coming back and at the slightest hint of doubt they should run to the hospital or the local person who is willing to take help give help in providing the care the other thing is the mean rejection treatment interval was indeed very long it was 10.9 plus minus 7 days so this is something that one needs to work on um, because it is well established that if a rejection is treated within 48 hours of onset the success in reversing the reversal and saving the graft is that much more so therefore as you can see in this study the patients who had rejection successful rejection reversal was in only 25% so corneal graft rejection was the leading cause of graft failure of these of this group of pediatric keratoplasty patients one more important slide before i go on to the practical tips of surgery and the reason i'm highlighting all of this is because surgery is not the only thing in these children it's having the entire package of being sure that it is the surgery clear graft and the full vision and the full care that one is providing now lamella procedures in children have made a sea change in all these outcomes anterior lamella surgeries are definitely superior so whenever possible one will prefer to do a anterior lamella procedure like a dal for an ear okay and certainly if there is only posterior layer involvement like a, 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 a chain then definitely um, dsec is the way to go there's no doubt 
Now here again, uh, experience from places, it's important to spread this information, uh, healthcare education, by eye banking and coordination. It's very important in building the resources and getting the information across to the eye banking community that we have a whole lot of children waiting for keratoplasty for whom we require good cornea, good healthy cornea from young donors. And if you give them positive feedback, and in this eye donation fortnight, also we hope that this, these kind of stories can motivate the eye donation counselors to make sure that they are making more efforts. And even if they give to the donor family the story, that a small child will be able to benefit from your gift of sight. That makes a huge difference. Now, talking about surgery, when you have patients like this, sometimes you will find that the, uh, the, 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 the um, limbal stem cells are actually uh, encroaching onto the area of the, of the patient's cornea, which you are going to refine. In that case, one could either go for a slightly smaller graft or one can disinsert the limbal stem cells by a lamella dissection, separate it be, behind and then refine the cornea in order to protect the limbal stem cells because that is what you are going to need for the re-epithelization of the graft. So this is what I'm doing in this case because I had made a circle. In children also, I usually don't like to go less than seven millimeter uh, host refined. If you go at 6.5, um, that you're transferring too few endothelial cells, plus the suturing is coming very close to the visual axis. So when I put the circle of seven millimeters, it was encroaching onto that uh, area of the limbus, uh, limbus stem cell. So therefore this is what uh, I do, that I then separate it and then proceed with the surgery. And of course, IOCT in this case had shown that the, it was a case of Peter's anomaly. And uh, the other important thing I would say that uh, I like to uh, define the host cornea first. And I like to go for the 0.75 millimeter oversized graft because that gives you a deeper anterior chamber, less stress on the uh, trabecular meshwork and uh, less post kk glaucoma. And then this was the flaringa ring. The rest of the steps of the surgery are fairly standard as you would do in any other case. Coming to the um, next slide. So um, as you, you may have cases like this where uh, it is completely uh, opaque, the corneal diameter may be small, and some people have even recommended using keratoprosthesis in such patients if it is bilateral. That is a way that could be considered, but if you're going to have poor follow-up and the patient is going to come back with a graft infection, it can be quite de devastating and the patient can end up losing the eye. So it's very important to try to give the chance for keratoplasty. One can even do limbal stem cell transplantation in a patient like this. This, where you have a superficial vascularization, one can initially do a limbal stem cell transplantation. If the patient has got a unilateral involvement, it is no problem. One can do a SLET and then one can follow that with a keratoplasty. Sometimes in some patients with the SLET itself, the vision can improve to a reasonable level, so which you do not require the keratoplasty. If it's a bilateral case, then one can do either a head or, or dollar, uh, uh, allograft or one can do a conjunctival um, graft initially and then later one can proceed for uh, penetrating keratoplasty or anterior lamella keratoplasty. So here's another example, trauma-induced corneal opacity. The patient, had, the parent, my mother was well counseled, very well motivated, came for a graft rejection, was successfully treated. And this is another example of corneal graft uh, um, transplant with regular follow-up. The other thing, this is an example of what I meant when talking about the uh, uh, eye donation counselor. So we have a 10 month old child who required surgery. And here we see that the donor details are 25 year old. Now, normally in a case of electric shock, uh, it goes for a post-mortem, but by communicating to the forensic team, the investigating officer, as well as the uh, family that we have a child waiting, one can expedite and arrange for the eyes to be taken before the post-mortem. Sometimes the forensic teams are very adamant that they will not allow anything to be done before post-mortem, but they are willing to conduct the post-mortem outside working hours, as happens in AIMS. The forensic department in our hospital has had their own valid reasons for, um, for this, but they do not mind coming at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night and doing the post-mortem. And here again, I would emphasize that we need to push for legislation to permit the... Um, 
uh, verbal consent of the investigative officer and the forensic department by, by the state. So this can easily be done at the state level in the rules that in such cases, a verbal consent of the police and a verbal consent of the forensic department should be adequate to go ahead for uh, eye retrieval before postmortem where it is possible. Otherwise, we have to we have to push the, the forensic team that to please do the postmortem at odd hours. Here's another example, seven month old with an anterior segment of genesis here. Again, seven year old donor and uh, the dead preservation time was six hours again with a road traffic accident. So it involved a lot of coordination, a lot of hard work from everybody to run around and try to get the cornea in time. So these are the situations in which, so it looks very simple that, you know, you just got the cornea and you have transplanted it, but actually there's a huge lot of effort involved and we need to keep pushing because unless we make the effort, we're not going to get that many young donors for all these very young, young children who need to be operated. Here again, we have an example of an eight-year-old. This was a patient took Chad, had a penetrating keratoplasty in one eye and then had a DSEC in the other eye. Um, the the DSEC eye takes a little longer to clear up, but ultimately because of no, of no sutures, uh, over, over long term, the prognosis is better. Here's one more example of a child, one, one and a half years, one eye microphthalmos, and the other eye had an optical PK and one year post -operative. So I mean to say that this kind of a story of a very young child who otherwise completely blind totally helpless being restored to, to the normal world can be go a long way in um, motivating the people who are very resistant to donation and very resistant to facilitating and I, I would like to acknowledge all the help given by all the people pediatrics and uh, eye banking and the corneal transplantation community and all the people in the department who are actually working so hard even the follow-up of the patients even arranging for the surgeries and um, every little step of the way requires a lot of effort. Uh, but it's this smile and the fact that even the mothers, it is the mothers who really struggle. Often they will be coming alone with, uh, with the child, carrying all sorts of uh, you know, papers and they're not able to um, manage, but they are just for the love of the child and they have that hope. And I think we need to respect that. So we need to give them full support, um, particularly in very large public hospitals in private setup, I think some of these things may be easier. Uh, but the kind of profile of patients we see, um, I think we really need to do be more doing more from the government side uh, to give them help. Even in the um, national health uh, mission and the uh, uh, ABPNG, we have recommended that for keratoplasty, they should support not only the surgery, but also the medications and follow up for two years because the follow up visits also each visit to the hospital may cost the family 800 900 thousand rupees, which can be a lot for a very poor family. So I would like to say that um, the actual surgery, there are a few things I've shared because of lack of time, but I'd like to emphasize that, uh, you know, the whole picture is a, a very important. And sometimes, you know, people are very enthusiastic. You operate on a child, unilateral opacity, other eye perfectly normal, minimal opacity, nebular opacity. And you may be unlucky and that particular donor cornea may carry an infection and you may end up with that eye actually going into is due to an end of thalmitis. So you have to keep your balance, look at what you're doing and uh, also have a discussion with the family so that later they don't feel, oh, we never knew that this could happen and we never knew that the eye could become in such a terrible state. And if we knew, we would not have gone for the surgery. And you yourself feel terrible sometimes that this very, very rare scenario happens. Um, so um, with that, I'd like to end and I'll be happy to take any questions. Madam, uh, um, good evening. Good evening. Yes. In children, madam, early suture loosening and infiltration is very common. So shall we remove all the sutures after six months or a little bit earlier? Thanks. That's what I think. I'm so sorry. I forgot to mention. Thank you for mentioning it. Children, yes. The suture becomes loose very early because the healing is very quick. So the, goal, the, the general rule of thumb is if the child is less than one year old, you can remove the sutures as early as two or three months of age. So one, roughly one month more than the age of the child. 
uh, maybe two months will be like too, ag too aggressive, but by three or four months, you can remove the sutures. But when you do the EUA, if you find a loose suture, you must remove it. And supposing you find the loose, the suture is loose at about four or five weeks and the wound looks well healed, you do not have to replace it. If it's, a suture becomes very loose less than three weeks after surgery, then of course you have to replace it. So if it's a two-year-old child, you can re uh, remove the sutures at four months. If it's a three-year-old child, you can remove it at six months, all the sutures. And what I recommend is even when you're planning to remove the sutures, first you remove the alternate sutures. And you see how the graft is behaving when it's removed. removed. And if the graft is very stable, go ahead and remove all. Or you remove half and then remove the other half after a month. The other thing is after suture removal, step up the steroids, increase them, supposing it was whatever the baseline, increase it to four to six times a day for a week. And after a week, come back to the baseline, whatever it was, and of course, cover with antibiotics. Thank you, madam. And oh, another afternoon. question, but, uh, sorry. how long do you keep these children on steroids? Like, Yes, so, um, sorry, sorry. Uh, so we keep the patients on steroids. Um, uh, firstly, we're very frequent steroids for the first month. And what I've started doing is uh, uh, I've started giving more strong steroids for the first month because that is when you want to uh, sort of really suppress the immune stimulation. So I use a combination of moxifloxacin and dexamethasone four times a day for one month. After a month, I switched to prednisolone phosphate, p -lone, because it is a clear solution. I use that four times a day for two months. So that the child is now three months post-op, then three times a day till six months, and then either twice a day p -lone, or uh, switch to fluoromethalone three times a day. And at the end of one year, they will continue on either FMN or p -lone once a day. Regarding the antibiotics, I give them, uh, as I said, my, uh, I give a combination of Vigamox and dexamethasone for the first month. After that, they, 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 they are not on any antibiotics. And one more thing I've started doing is um, when I do the surgery, I put a bandage contact lens. And one week later, we do the EUA and remove the bandage contact lens so that, you know, any little epithelial um, erosion, epithelial defect or the epithelial regrowing, all those problems get taken care of. Plus, the child is very comfortable. But you must make sure you tell, tell the mother that there is a BCL and after a week it has to be removed and they have to come for that EUA. Uh, so these are the few changes I've made, which... Um, which I find useful and I, for long term, they need to be on once a day steroid. Thank you. Uh, hello, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, a wonderful talk as usual. I just had a question. Like you mentioned, you've partially answered that about glaucoma and it, you know, not having a very good outcome. So how aggressive would you be? We have a lot of children like referred from a glaucoma clinic. Sometimes the child is one-eyed, a tube or a trab has been done. The cup is 0 0.7, 0 0.8. And you can clearly see that the cornea is edematous, but the child is able to, you know, somehow manage, do his ambulatory activities, not good enough for schoolwork. A one-eyed child. So how aggressive are you in these children? It was no, very difficult. At all. I, I'm driven yeah. by the vision. You know, you uh, because you're aiming for something, the moon, but sometimes you may not reach yes. there. So definitely you go by the vision, particularly with one eye, um, the, the, the child should not have very severe pain, should not be at risk of getting, you know, infectious keratitis from the ruptured bully. But if it's if the child has adequate vision for the daily work, then you can give hypersol if required, but it doesn't help that much in these children. And um, uh, some, because often the opacity is not actual edema now, it's, the, it's recovered and it's now a, a sort of an opacification. I'm not very aggressive. Yeah. Uh, same here, so I just wanted to. Yeah. And sometimes one also tends to see a very uh, silent kind of a rejection. I'm not sure if uh, I'm correct, but sometimes a child's eye is white, but once you take them up for an EUA and you see there are a lot of pigments on the back surface endothelium, which were not there earlier. And then gradually over the next two or three EUAs, you notice that the graft is failing. Uh, so is that silent kind of uh, that? I've seen it in quite a few children and... Uh, I'm not exactly sure what it, you know. I know. I've also seen that sometimes in these are really not sure whether it's a patient who had a very reje mild rejection, which was then missed, and now it's a decompensating graft. So if I have a, a situation like this, I'll always give it the benefit of the doubt that it was a missed rejection. And then for rejection, I will give one hourly steroids for 48 hours and then two hourly for 48 hours. I don't give dexamethasone and all in children. 
but in adults, I find it very useful uh, and IV pulse. But in children, I will give the topical steroids. I don't think oral steroids are that effective. You have to give a very high dose and you know, but the topical steroids you can give and along with homatropine and then reassess after those three, four days. Just giving it the benefit, whatever had to happen, had to happen and then you taper it. Uh, a lot of them don't recover sometimes, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, there is one question uh, from the audience. Yes. Can we plant a pediatric cornea in an adult patient? I think uh, they are trying to ask it uh, from the point of view of different videos. Yes. Quite right. Yes. So um, now th this is another thing. Generally, uh, corneas of children less than three years of age are smaller in diameter and low in tensile strength. And they tend to lead to um, the more difficult to suture. So they tend to lead to more astigmatism or even a, a sort of a myopic shift. Having said that, if you have a patient who is one night and that's the cornea you have, uh, then it, it doesn't matter if there's going to be a little bit of astigmatism or if there's going to be a little bit of myopic shift. So you can use it, uh, but I would, if you have a child, it's always much better to use that pediatric cornea for a pediatric patient. Now, if you really see many people below the age of three, they would take it like we will not harvest the cornea. But if you have a child below the age of three, then you certainly you can use that pediatric cornea. So this question would mean simple. Can you use a question? Can you use a pediatric cornea in an adult? You can, but these are going to be the problems. There's going to be difficulty in suturing. There will be a little myopic shift. And also there would be more astigmatism. And you'll also have the feeling that why didn't I use it for a child? And can you take a pediatric cornea for donation below the age of three if you have a child? But then just don't take it and waste it. That should never happen. So if you feel you're not going to be able to use that cornea of a child less than three, then uh, you shouldn't, the eye bank shouldn't take it. And if you take it, then make sure you transfer it to some surgeon who will be able to use it. And one final question point on this topic is um, uh, when you, in case you're doing a DSEC and you're going to cut the tissue yourself, if the, if, if the age is below 15 years, again, you may have difficulty in cutting the tissue and also being smaller, it may not fit that nicely in the artificial anterior chamber. If you're planning a DSEC, it's better to take it, uh, if it's below, above, below 20, expect problems, below 10, don't, pl don't plan for using it for a, uh, for a DSEC because you're likely to make a problem in the dissection. Uh, Ma'am, there is one more question. What should be the minimum endothelial cell count for a pediatric transplantation? Uh, see, um, there's no such thing. Uh, basically, any cornea with a count of 2000 plus has adequate cells to survive. Naturally, you would like the more, the more, the better. So 2500, 2800, young donor, definitely this would be better. So one would like in a pediatric case that the donor age also should be within 15 to 20 years, but it's not always possible to get this. So therefore, um, you, uh, I would say the minimum should be 2000 for a, a PK or an EK. In fact, for EK, people say it should be at least 2500. But Routinely, we are, we are having to use corneas, which are even 2,100 for EK, and they do survive. So um, I would say minimum 2,000, more the better. Uh, and the age is more important because the younger corneas, the, 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 the endothelial cells are more resilient and they do recover. The tissue does recover. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask to be excused because unfortunately I have another session going on, which is also running out of, out of sync. Uh, and Zoom doesn't allow me to join both at the same time. So I'm really sorry I have to leave and come back. Thank you, ma'am, for a very informative talk today. Thank you for being with us. And Good uh, evening, Radhika, ma'am. Good evening. Hello, Radhika. Same, same to you, Ragini. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Hi. And now I invite Professor Ragini Parekh uh, for a lecture on penetrating keratoplasty changing indications and outcome. Madam Ragini. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhavna Sharma, my very close friend. And uh, thank you for the invitation. And it's a wonderful program. Uh, you know, this program, when we have it this way, it uh, just, uh, you know, it solidifies the thing that we should all work more uh, as you are doing right now. 
uh, for promoting keratoplasty after the wonderful talks uh, my professor Klaus, uh, Padmashi, Dr. Dityal sir, Dr. Samar Basak and Dr. Radhika ma'am. I'll be speaking on uh, this topic of changing indications and outcomes in penetrating keratoplasty. I thank Dr. Bhavna and Ames for inviting me again. Uh, so, you know, it was Dr. Edward Zerm who was the first one to do uh, of the first clinical uh, penetrating keratoplasty in 1905, uh, a complete human transplant. Now, over a period of years since then, there have been uh, so many changes that have occurred. And as we all know that ophthalmology is one of the fast evolving uh, branches today with regards to the cornea or the cataract. So the keratoplasty indications have changed over a period of years uh, from the beginning. So as we can see over here, uh, what were the indications of the keratoplasty over a period of years? As you can see over here, I... so from 1983 to 1988, then to 1995 and up to 2000. So these are the various causes for which a penetrating keratoplasty was done. And that was pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, a regraft, keratoconus, pukes, scarred cornea, corneal ulcer, herpes infections, and a phagic bullous keratopathy. As you can see over here, that the pseudophagic bullous keratopathy remained at the top over a period of years, followed by regraft and a phagic bullous keratopathy in the past. So in the era prior to 1980, uh, the main indication for transplantation was corneal scarring. And then the era of cataract surgeries came with the implantation of anterior chamber intraocular lenses. Because of the anterior chamber intraocular lenses, as you know, the corneal endothelial touch caused the cornea to decompensate. And most of these patients came to us with pain, uh, with Boulay, and we had to explant most of these lenses. And it, so 64% of the patients with PBK had anterior chamber lenses. From 1990 to 1995, the leading indication uh, was anterior chamber lenses uh, and the posterior chamber lenses were associated with 36.4%. Now, I remember starting, uh, I mean, beginning to learn phaco emulsification in 1990s. And one patient, I was caring for a patient so much and she used to bring me bananas every day, but she didn't realize that the corneal opacity that she has was caused by me trying to learn FACO, which is something that I confess. People may or may not confess, but this is what happened. The posterior timber lenses uh, increased that time and the percentage of PBK with posterior chamber lenses also increased to 65%. The use of anterior chamber lenses decreased and hence the percentage of PBK with anterior chamber lenses decreased. But that was also the phase where we were learning phaco emulsification and the damage due to phaco emulsification, uh, emulsification must be kept in mind. From 2000 onwards, bullous keratopathy and regrafts were the cause of, of the uh, penetrating keratoplasties. The IBank Association of America reported that from 1980, where 14,400 uh, were done, to 1990, where there were 36,000 uh, requiring to be done, which was an increase. So do we have the same set of patients and do we have the same indications as to why uh, these patients require peritating keratoplasty? So if you do a global survey, Geographically, uh, the, the environment, the workplace, the, the, the class and the style of the living conditions of the people may be responsible in the changing reasons why which we need penetrating keratoplasty. So as you see, uh, these are, you can divide them into seven areas. So in North America, the main reason would be uh, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. You know, when we had done a course of SICS a few years back, uh, you know, I realized that SICS was not taught in the Americas at all, and they were learning SICS then. They started immediately with learning phaco emulsification after extracapsular cataract surgery. And learning phaco emulsification has a steeper curve, 
and uh, you know more damage to the endothelium before you get acknowledged with the machines that could have been the reason we graft because of graft failures keratoconus and fukes south america corneal scars because of injuries or infections keratoconus pseudophagy bullous keratopathy and we graft Uh, this was the way, uh, and this was the order in which the indications were for penetrating keratoplasty in Europe: keratoconus, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, and keratitis. Africa: keratoconus, keratitis, and pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. In the Middle East: keratoconus, corneal scars, and pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. In Australia: keratoconus, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, and regraft. Whereas in Asia, keratitis, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, regraft, and corneal scars. Now, in our conditions, if you see the patients, and uh, even if you divide the patients into the urban and the rural setups, you find a lot of patients who are working in the rural setup. They have a lot of injury with vegetative matter or trauma while working. They come late to us so that early treatment is not possible. Most of these patients who come to us in the institutes. they come with a full fledged corneal abscess or having treated um, the keratitis in various ways either you know self treatment or by quads or self medication over the counter medication with steroids which is very very common and hence uh, requiring a graft so you know the conditions in various areas of the world are different the indications requiring keratoplasty and even in india uh, the urban and the rural setup may have different indications so in our in at wilsons hospital they said that pseudophagic bullous keratopathy remains the leading indication for corneal transplantation uh, followed by a regraft that was the case the percentage has uh, in, they said increased significantly with pcios and i think with acios it decreased because the use of acios uh, decreased corneal scarring including adherent leukoma active infectious keratitis are relatively more common indications uh, in india or in our country whereas keratoconus pbk and fuchs dystrophy are less common uh, then they are reported from the developed ones indications for keratoplasty carry a much poorer prognosis for graft survival Uh, which is more common in india than in the developed world because you know like i said that the patients there are more patients with active keratitis it may be viral viral which is treated with steroids or not treated properly vegetative matter injury uh, industrial injury because of lack of use of safety gear and uh, just uh, you know pure lack of awareness of the eye health education uh, uh, you know we have a lot of injuries we have a lot of injuries in children uh, because of uh, you know trauma with the bow and arrow or needle so every day in our institute or in your institute the emergency would be very busy with the trauma patients and especially uh, with large corneal tears or cornea injuries which later require a secondary surgery so the current scenario as we have been seeing now in the last few uh, talks that of course penetrating keratoplasty in many cases or many indications has been replaced by dsec dmac and in keratoconus by dal so definitely the indications of penetrating keratoplasty have grown less and less because of the advantages of the lamellar procedures where the anterior chamber or the anterior segment uh, remains undisturbed so definitely where there is the ability to do a surgery which can be done without opening the anterior chamber that is preferred so as we know that it is not the strongest of the species that survive nor the most intelligent but the most what the one most responsive to change that is the theory of evolution by the great charles darwin so long term survival after penetrating keratoplasty so we have discussed the indications which are different in different areas region to region and in the same state from urban to rural after the graft is done as we have been discussing in pediatric age groups uh, with uh, dr basak sir and now the changing scenario with covid it is not only just doing the graft or like say if you do a cataract surgery follow up the patient on the seventh day 
see him after a month, give him glasses and forget him for a year or two till he may or may not develop a posterior capsule or opacification. Graphs require a careful follow-up and the, the success of a graph not only uh, is dependent on the surgeon, but the patient who may be lost to follow up, who may not put the drops properly because the long-term requirement of graft, the long-term requirement of drops, uh, early, uh, you know, coming back to the hospital in cases of redness because the patient may have a loose suture which acts as a nidus for infection. The patient may not turn up and the, it may be difficult for the patient to come and therefore there are so many factors on which the graft success uh, is determined. The common causes of uh, graft failure was endothelial failure because of the quality of eyeballs. Though Samar Basak sir said that, you know, and I think uh, it has opened our eyes to the elder eyeball, the elderly eyeballs. Uh, basically, you know, uh, we, are, we were always scared because we always thought that the older the cornea, the low the endothelial count. But the ease with which the cornea, uh, the younger corneas are available, because of superstition, because of you know the trauma of a young death, so we are we always end up with compromised corneas, uh, you know older corneas, but we need them and we have to use them. So that is endothelial failure, graft rejection. A first time graft, uh, the survival with under optimum uh, circumstances was very good at ninety percent at five years and eighty two percent at ten years. So basically, you know, it also depends on the condition or the indication for the optical uh, or the therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. Because in keratoconus, it's an avascular cornea. You have a clear cornea available. The anterior segment is not disturbed. The survival rate of the graft is very good. And in Fuchs dystrophy also. In a fake bullous keratopathy, without a lens uh, placement, because maybe uh, of the vitreous and the endothelial touch or a complicated surgery, or if the patients were affected for many, many years, the endothelial count was low because of the vitreous damage uh, continuously to the endothelium. So there are a lot of factors which determine the success of the graft. And like Dr. Radhika Tandon, Madam, was saying that it is not only in pediatric age groups, but the availability of a donor cornea is so less that once you have a donor cornea and once you have grafted, it is the duty of all of us to counsel the patient and ensure survival because uh, of the graft because for that patient, it is important that the graft would be very dangerous and the paucity of cornea that once the patient has been given a cornea, you would like to give uh, a second patient a chance and hence to ensure that each and every graft survives and you give optimum results is extremely important. After 10 to 15 years of penetrating keratoplasty, if the eye is quiet and if there are no further episodes of rejection, then it would be similar to a normal cornea. And uh, corneal thickness increase and late endothelial failure would be then the main cause of graft failure. So as the endothelial count in that donor decreased, it, it would be like a decompensating cornea in any other patient. Tectonic and therapeutic keratoplasty for corneal infection and perforation, however, constitute a significant major portion of corneal transplantation performed in um, our country, in our state. And definitely they carry a graver prognosis in terms of drive survival, especially because patients come very, very late. And if there's a whole total corneal abscess or if it's a herpetic infection, which is likely to recur in the graft itself, and Hence, uh, obviously, the survival rates for these graphs is much less than an optical keratoplasty. To conclude, I would say that the indications of keratoplasty have changed over the years. Uh, but since the advent of IOL, uh, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy is the most common indication. I would like, as a teacher of a teaching medical college, and as Dr. Bhavna Sharma and team would agree, that, uh, you know, it's so important for us. I, when I was learning, my professor taught me that please treat the cornea like God, protect it, learn slowly, because the cornea can never be replaced. So stay away from the cornea, don't damage the cornea, use viscoelastic, uh, pr protect the cornea when you are putting in the IOL, learn SICS or learn a few steps first and then do a uh, complete FAPO emulsification because we see that a lot of it is iatrogenic. 
because of uh, you know the fast life the fast things that we want and the fast uh, learning that we want because learning curve is something that uh, it takes its time and we must think of the patient first newer surgical techniques have substituted penetrating keratoplasty in fuchs keratoconus and pbk but corneal scars chemical injuries like we have so many line burn injuries because of tobacco and gutka which is not banned do need primary uh, penetrating keratoplasty as a primary resort availability of newer preservation media have increased utilization of tissues as dr basak sir said that in these testing times we have used preserved tissues for patients because we were scared to go uh, to pick up a cornea from a patient's house not knowing what the covid status was graft survival is one limitation of pk and regrafts are increasing as an indication of penetrating keratoplasty thank you uh, very much thank you for the opportunity uh, for this wonderful seminar dr bhavna sharma and it has been an eye opener to all of us um, thank you everybody uh, from the panel and uh, the team who is present here good evening dr kavita and uh, dr gautam i didn't wish you uh, when uh, we first started the seminar thank you so much thank you madam it was a very insightful and a wonderful talk as usual madam and uh, showing us the indication changing indication the outcome in penetrating keratoplasty so uh, we thank are thank you so much ma'am we are open for any questions if we have uh, ma'am we have one question from our pg uh, dr dipayan uh, yes please ask him uh, ha if you can if one eye is inoculated uh, because of choroidal melanoma can we harvest the cornea from that eye so normally you know the indications are that you know if the patient has an ocular tumor and especially a malignancy then you would not like to harvest or use the cornea especially in a penetrating keratoplasty so these are few contraindications and like uh, dr radhika ma'am was saying is that and as uh, i am sure that all the residents are being taught that if you are not going to use the cornea and if there is a dilemma in use of the cornea better better not to harvest it so as to not waste and to disrespect the donor thank you ma'am sir i have one question for professor claus that what is his experience of uh, of utilization of uh, corneas from elderly patients as uh, actually we don't have a problem we actually take we, we don't have an upper age limit uh, it's just that the the cell cell count should be uh, sufficient and that really worked well in in recent years because we also had a period of shortage and then we cut the the age limit and only focus on uh, in the cell cell count and transparency that works very well both for pkps for uh, in the cell cell transplantation Uh, do we have any more questions bitendu uh, uh yes ma'am uh, ma'am uh, there is one have, more question or uh, question actually uh, to professor claus that uh, do you have any experience or any uh, in vitro studies or any animal studies on uh, on biosynthetic stromal uh, implantations and uh, the cultured endothelial cell transplant into the for uh, endothelial dystrophy sir So, so we have experience with uh, fish scale based artificial cornea that sounds a bit weird but we can use uh, the fish scale of of tilapia and um cut it and shape it a little bit with the, with a laser and then it's pretty transparent and we have just finished a, a prospective trial in uh, patients with a penetrating injury to use where we have in settings where there is no donor tissue available to to cover the eye that works uh, very well it's well tolerated although it's fish it's a zeno transplant and that may um be one option for acute penetrating injury where you don't they don't have tissue available because this is something you have you can have on the shelf and uh, in the long term it may also be something which could be used as a carrier for for capro for example or eventually maybe as a replacement for uh, for pkp if we can find any serious cells to cover it but at the moment it's uh, used only for acute penetrating injury to cover the eye and then next step would be to use it as a capro carrier
Uh, I had a question for Professor Claus, ma'am, uh, Dr. Bhavna. Uh, do we have time? Please go yes. ahead. Yes. Yeah, Professor Claus, a very simple question. It was a lovely talk that you gave, and uh, one practical aspect I wanted to know. You mentioned about C3R for regressing corneal neovascularization. So, what is the protocol that is being used? Like, how much time? And is it just the periphery? Uh, something to do, sparing the limbal stem cells? How we do to be save this? So, what are the what are the protocols that are followed for corneal neovascularization? So actually, you could use the standard uh, Dresden protocol, but what we, in, in the last time we, we used the, um, the, the speed, the speedy version, basically, where you use Excellent. the nine, accelerated version, where you use the nine milliwatt and, and you just irradiate for nine minutes and uh, 10 minutes before you drop uh, the riboflavin eye drop. So in, in overall, it takes you just 20 minutes. And in fact, you can, if you combine it with the final diatomy, you can actually do both at the same time. So you can already instill the riboflavin while you do the um, fine needle diatomy and then do the cross-linking and then go on to the PKP so that it extends the procedural length only for yeah, 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, and is it just the periphery or cross-linking? I thought I heard you say the periphery or the center, the whole cornea. We cross the we cross link the, the whole cornea, even if you cut out the center in the end, but we, we cross link yes. the whole cornea. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we actually place a limbal shield, like for to use use for LASIK uh, to cover the, the limbal stem cells, but otherwise we just erase the, the whole cornea. Thank you. Uh, so there, there is one more question related to cross linking from our residents. Does cross-linking increase survival chances in low-risk transplants also? Oh, that's a very good question. So we don't we don't know yet. Actually, we we just set up a, a study to to answer this question. So I don't know. Maybe because we know that uh, cross-linking also destroys uh, immune cells, antigen-presenting cells. So you could expect that it also works in the lowest setting, but we don't know yet. Good question. Okay. Thank you, sir. We'll be looking forward to your. Research results. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we are towards the last part of our CME today. And uh, the last talk is on targeted corneal transplantation, less is more. And I think we have heard uh, almost everything from all our corneal uh, transplant masters. So nothing remains for me, but uh, I would be taking uh, this presentation on targeted corneal transplantation. And uh, is my screen visible? Yes, it is visible. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, visible. Yes. So, uh, so we know that penetrating keratoplasty, which is the which is the open sky technique uh, in which we replace the complete thickness of the cornea with the corresponding tissue from the recipient, but it may not be an answer to all epithelial and stromal uh, dystrophies because the rest of the corneal layers are not diseased here. And similarly, for ectatic and endothelial dystrophies also, the other layers are not uh, diseased except for the for the endothelium in endothelial dystrophies or maybe the stroma in the uh, ectatic dystrophies. So penetrating keratoplasty definitely is not an answer for these type of uh, disease conditions. In addition to complications like the suture related complications, suture infections, there may be uh, wound dissents, other uh, immune reactions and the boost dreaded that is the graft rejection. So um, uh, that is what that is in pursuit of better anatomical and visual outcome and also for achieving lesser chances of graft rejection, we have moved to penetrating keratoplasty to component keratoplasty and uh, thus I designed a talk on targeted corneal transplantation but less is definitely more. So here what we do is selective removal and replacement of the diseased corneal layer and we leave behind the healthy corneal layers. It is a less invasive procedure, but may require a finer surgical skill, but it is definitely worth all the efforts taken. And uh, so we target the disease tissue here, that is either the corneal epithelium, the corneal stroma, endothelium or stem cells selectively. 
and uh, the the uh, the main reasons for initiating this shift was there was an increasing gap or the increasing backlog of corneal tissues which was being added every year and also our ability to split the donor cornea into desirable thickness and uh, there was the, of course the quick post operative recovery and better utilization of the donor tissue and also the lesser chances of graft rejection so evolution has been taken by ragni madam from uh, from the resinger to perform the first animal grafting to the charles tillett performing endothelial keratoplasty we have come a long way from penetrating keratoplasty to targeted corneal transplantation and once we want to start uh, lamellar transplantation or the targeted transplantation it is good to know about the anatomical structure of the cornea that is the epithelium bowman's membrane the stroma the thickest part that is the 500 microns and the important is the desmet's membrane endothelial complex around 20 microns so uh, this is a brief uh, overview that is the lamellar keratoplasty can be done by two ways that is the anterior lamellar procedures and the endothelial keratoplasty anterior lamellar mainly depending on the depth can be superficial anterior lamellar or the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty and the endothelial is mainly the DSEC and the DMEC. Uh, depending on the technique used or the machine used, they can be automated uh, microkeratome assisted uh, anterior lamellar keratoplasty and uh, similarly for, uh, for the endothelial keratoplasty and also the femtosecond laser assisted shaped corneal transplantation. So this is what we are targeting in penetrating keratoplasty. As you can see, the A, A image where you are removing the whole of the cornea, the B is the superficial anterior lamellar keratoplasty where just the 160 microns tissue is removed. The C is the deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. We are removing the 95% of the cornea here and uh, the, the DMAC and the DSEC, that is the endothelial keratoplasty, which are targeting only the, uh, the Desmet's membrane endothelial complex. And the indications are more or less similar to what the PK, that is the optical indications, tectonic and therapeutic mainly. So the optical uh, we can do for scars, uh, most common which we, which we see in our scenario is traumatic and post corneal ulcer scars, the herpetic scars, post herpetic uh, scars, surgical trauma because of chemical injuries, dystrophies, it can be epithelial, Bowman's membrane or stromal dystrophies degenerations and ectasias like keratoconus, which are one of the important indications and of course, post-refractive ectasias. Tectonic, mainly done for desmatocele, PMDs, uh, radiance marginal degenerations and many causes of UKs. And therapeutic, we know it is one of the commonest indication for doing uh, keratoplasty in India is the infective, that is the post-infective keratitis cases. And we can do it for tumors, dermoids and inflammatory cases. So the anterior lamellar keratoplasty first, that is the superficial where we just target uh, the superficial 160 microns and the deep where the 95% of the tissue is targeted around 1495 microns is removed. The superficial anterior lamellar keratoplasty is reserved for very superficial uh, lesions like these bucklers or Salzman nodular degeneration. We just remove the superficial layer. And uh, the advantage here is that in case of recurrence of the same disease in the graph, you still have the chance to do a DALC in those patients. The deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty mainly done for the stromal dystrophy, mainly the granular, the latest dystrophies, the stromal scars and the corneal ectasias, keratoconus being one of the important indications. And also the surgical technique, uh, I would like to start with the big bubble technique. That is the, uh, the big bubble technique. Uh, it involves the partial refination of around 65% depth of the cornea and later on debulking this, uh, this superficial layer and we create a big bubble between the rest of the corneal stroma, that is the 50% depth of the corneal stroma and the Desmet's membrane. And once the big bubble is created, uh, the brave slash and we remove the, the, the overlying uh, stromal tissue from the Desmet's membrane. And this is the glistening, the figure, the, uh, the figure E, which is the very glistening Desmet's membrane, which shines through. And we can replace a correspondingly sized graft and suture it with the 16 interrupted sutures or the continuous sutures. Other techniques which have been described is the viscoelastic dissection in case of failed big bubble and uh, we dissect with the help of viscoelastic and uh, into the deeper layers. Uh, other techniques which have been described are the hydrodelamination, the manual layer by layer dissection in cases of failed bubble, the air assisted manual, uh, manual dissection and the air guided deep stromal dissection technique of the MELIS. Uh, the microkeratome assisted technique, the advantage is that we get a smooth edge both for the recipient and the donor. So the interface scarring and irregular astigmatism in the post-operative period is fairly less. It gives a smooth central host bed, though the instrument, uh, the overall instrument cost would be more in such patients. 
and uh, transplanting the uh, the donor cornea we just removed the desmets membrane and transplanted with the interrupted suture this is uh, one of the surgery videos which was a scarred anterior uh, the deep stromal scar present in this lady and we do uh, tried doing a big bubble later on we completed the procedure with the manual dissection so centration of the centration of the the disease and marking with the trephine the vacuum trephine is applied and after getting the adequate refination of the tissue that is up to 65% depth we start debulking the anterior corneal layers we debulk the anterior uh, corneal layers very carefully in these patients especially the scar tissue because you have to avoid the scars in the central area move from the periphery towards the center we de debulk the scar tissue to reach to reach up to the less left, left uh, section and transplanted with the rest of the tissue and this was the post operative outcome of the patient the complications of dal can be the desmets membrane perforation or the formation of pseudo anterior chamber uh, the rare complication of the fixed dilated that is the urethral zavalier syndrome there can a potential uh, complication of interface wrinkling if the sufficient stromal tissue is not removed and the suturing is not uh, is not proper and of course interface vascularization and opacification can be seen in addition to interface keratitis and sometimes the suture related complications however the advantage uh, outweigh everything that is the advantages are so much that it can outweigh all the complications there's no risk of endothelial graft rejection there's wider acceptance of donor tissues that is you can use non optical tissues there's no age limit for these patients because the desmets membrane is being removed it is an extraocular surgery and a rapid rehabilitation can be achieved and almost no chance of primary or late graft rejection and you can also do a larger uh, diameter graft in such cases and also because of uh, decreased chances of rejection there's no need for long term steroid prophylaxis and of course this has to be taken as guarded and some patients may require long term but most of the patients may not uh, i would skip the types of big bubbles here yes so the shaped lamellar keratoplasty is another development in the targeted corneal transplantation where we create the shaping of the corneal graft through femtolaser and these the different shapes can be the zigzag top pat and the mushroom grafting and it provides better healing and uh, of course because there is a better apposition of the tissues there can be early suture removal and reduced astigmatism these are the configurations which us which can be taken that is the top hat mushroom uh, which is an inverse top hat and the zigzag configuration and we you can read this uh, this uh, article on the shaped corneal transplantation moving on to the endothelial keratoplasty the desmets membrane endothelial or dmac and the dsec the difference is that the dmac only the desmets membrane and the endothelial complex is transplanted whereas in the dsec the deep part of the stroma is also transplanted so the thickness of the tissue in dmac is around 20 whereas in the dsec it is somewhere around 150 to 180 microns and hence there is a post operative shift in dsec and the visual result is not as good as the dmac procedure the indications by and large for both the procedures are same that is the fuchs endothelial dystrophy the pseudopecic and epecic bullous keratoplasty post pk endothelial rejection and the ic syndromes now this is a very quick video of the dsec uh, in one of our patients after uh, mounting the tissue on the artificial anterior chamber you you give an incision with a guarded knife around 350 microns to the periphery of the cornea and we we do the dissection the lamellar dissection of the 
year 2000 that the stoma be progressed into the deeper layers with a careful destruction not to damage the breast membrane. Beyond the center, you take a curved dissector and we progress from limbus to limbus that is the full circumference of the cornea is dissected. operative outcome of the patient. The ultra thin DSEC also that is the DSEC which is uh, it is something between the DSEC and the DMAC that is the procedure is uh, done by utilizing around less than 100 microns of the tissue. The stromal layer is further less as compared to the DSEC so the uh, post-operative hyperopic shift is less in this cases though the visual uh, outcome would be comparable to DMAC. So the Desmet's membrane endothelial keratoplasty was beautifully shown by Dr. Samar Basak and uh, the stripping of the Desmet's membrane from the recipient is same as the DSEC. It is only the preparation of the Desmet's membrane is important through the injector we inject and through the unfolding of the graft and appropriate uh, positioning of the graft in the, at its place and doing a bubbling and forming with the help of the anterior chamber, with a big bubble in the anterior chamber. The, the complications which can be encountered in the endothelial keratoplasty are mainly the graft mm -hmm. dislocation, which may require rebubbling and graft rejection in some cases, which can be managed adequately and appropriately in, in certain cases. And uh, the main advantage is, again, it outweighs the risk. So the faster visual recovery, the better maintenance of the preservation of the anterior corneal curvature and markedly less post-operative astigmatism. The tectonic strength is more and there are no suture related complications. A word about the future directives, that is, the, we have got now the row kinase inhibitors. The, the studies have been done, the pilot studies have been done, in which we have, uh, there have been, uh, it have been demonstrative of cell proliferation and cell addition into the substrate, and also it suppresses the apoptosis of corneal endothelial cells, and these have been tried in FECDs. Also, the, the, the Bowman layer transplantation, which is uh, which has been uh, put forth by the Rotterdam Institute, and it, it selectively uses uh, this technique in keratoconus and the subepithelial scarring after PR case. Here, the transplantation of the Bowman's membrane specifically into the into the superficial stroma, which gives tectonic strength to the to the tissue to the recipient. However, the long term visual outcome is still awaited. You can read our publication on the Bowman's membrane transplantation. The tissue engineering for corneal endothelium is again, which is something being developed. That is, the, we are hard, we, we are culturing the human corneal endothelial cell on adequate substrates, which can be amniotic membrane, corneal stroma, 
collagen sheets and sometimes the silk fibrions and these sheets are then transplanted as endothelial graft and uh, these were the recent uh, recent uh, techniques which are being tried both in vitro and and, and in animal models and uh, I look forward to our book on corneal emergencies which would be released shortly and uh, thank you very much. That is my institute, uh, this, the institute uh, rapidly growing from Central India, and that is my team. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you. Yes, I think we are to. Uh, we have concluded all our sessions. If we have any more questions, we can take. I would uh, like to ask Professor Claus one more, I think would be probably the last question, that do you have any experience of, uh, of uh, topical immunosuppressive agents being used for, uh, for uh, in high-risk keratoplasty, sir? When we use the topical steroids as a standard treatment, uh, um, starting with five times a day, tapering it down to once a day, and then keep it for at least two years, um, we have extensively studied the use of uh, cyclosporin in a, in a local fashion, even as an implant, and that does not have a significant effect on graft survival. You can use it to treat dry eye and other things, but for the high-risk graft survival, the topical cyclosporin, even in a high-release depot, doesn't seem to have a significant effect. So we are, I think we are stuck with the topical steroids, which should be used intensively and long time, even sometimes li lifelong, um, to reduce the risk of, of graft rejection. Right. And how frequently are you using the systemic immune suppressants then? Uh, are you using them frequently, the, the high-risk grafts? No, since it's okay. also not, not really evidence-based, we only give it yeah. perioperatively and we rarely use it uh, nowadays. Right. So uh, since we do not have any more questions and we have completed all our talks and uh, I now request Dr. Saroj Gupta to please propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, madam. So on behalf of Department of Ophthalmology, Ames Bhopal, I express my sincere gratitude to the guest of honor, Professor Ram Sarman Singh, Director and CEO Ames Bhopal, for sparing time out of his busy schedule to join us in the event. And th thanks for uh, his encouraging words. And he has always been very encouraging and supporting us to organize such events. My special thanks to Professor Claus for sharing his experience on newer options in high-risk keratoplasty, especially the techniques to deal with corneal neovascularization, the fine needle diathermy, and the uh, cross-linking. So we are honored to have you with us. I extend my gratitude to Professor G.S. Titiar, Chief of Arthur Center Ames, Delhi, for his enlightening talk on new norms in eye banking and keratoplasty in COVID times. It gives us immense pleasure to have learned a lot from such a proficient personality. I would like to thank Professor Radhika Tandon for sharing the key points and challenges faced in uh, keratoplasty in children. And we have learned a lot from her talk. It was very informative. My sincere thanks to Dr. Uh, Samar Basak for uh, his thought-provoking talk on efficient utilization of donor cornea uh, uh, during the shortage of the tissue during COVID times. My special thanks to Professor Ragini Parikh for the update on changing trains indications on PK over time and the outcome. It was a very good talk, madam. Thank you so much. I would like to thank all the chairpersons, Professor Kavita Bhatnagar, Professor Radhika Tandon, Professor Ragini Parikh, Dr. Samar Basak, and Dr. Prana Upadhyay for chairing the session. My sincere thanks to our expert panel, Dr. Chintan Malhotra, Dr. Deepak Mishra, Dr. Gautam Singh, and Dr. Arvind Maurya for their valuable inputs. My sincere thanks also to all the participants who attended the webinar with great enthusiasm and asked many questions, made it interactive and successful. Least but surely not the least, I thank Mr. Sunil for uh, smoothly handling the technical part of the webinar. So once again, I thank you all for being with us this evening. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Good evening, all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.